Well, hello and welcome again to Rare Classic Cars. It's another weekend, but this time it is cold here in the Midwest. The temperature has plummeted into the 20s, but that does not preclude me from sitting out on the, I guess, iconic porch for a porch chat. And what are we going to talk about today? I thought an interesting topic of conversation would be General Motors engines and how did they have so many engines back in the day? And then what happened to that strategy over time? Why did it evolve? So just for reference, if you go back to the pre-1976 you know, 1976 and before era, in terms of the V8s, General Motors had a number of V8s. Each division had its own. So Chevrolet had a different one from a Pontiac, different from an Oldsmobile, different from a Buick, different from a Cadillac. But as you get into the post-1976 era, a number of these engines start to go away and get consolidated. So again, if you have a General Motors vehicle from 1976 or before, and it's a full-size car, intermediate car, and it's a V8, the chances are you have a different engine in a Chevrolet from a Pontiac, Olds, Buick, Cadillac, even if they're the same displacement. So a Chevrolet 350, is not the same as a Pontiac 350, not the same as an Olds 350, not the same as a Buick 350, despite the same size of the engines. Uh, and really all they share are distributors and some carburetors and maybe some spark plugs, but that's about it. The internals of the engine are totally different, and oil filters. But how could this happen? How could you have each division have its own flavor back in the day? Well. Let's talk about economies of scale. And I've got my little whiteboard here again. So look at 1959. This is the Chevrolet production. Chevrolet produced 1.4 million vehicles in 1959. And they had three engines. I'm not counting carburation here, just the number of engines. They had a 235 cubic inch six cylinder, a 283 cubic inch V8, and a 348 cubic inch V8. Now, let's look at Pontiac in 1959. They sold 382,000 vehicles, and they had one engine, a 389 cubic inch V8. Again, multiple stages of carburation, etc., but one basic engine. Fast forward to 20 years later, Chevrolet was now selling over 2 million vehicles, 2.2 million vehicles per year, but they had nine engines in those 2.2 million vehicles. Everything from four cylinders to various six cylinders to various eight cylinder engines. Pontiac was selling 900,000 vehicles, so again, a marked increase from 1959, but they had seven engines. Again, a series of four cylinders, V6s, V8s, all different engines. So. If I just did a high level look at how many engines per car on average were used, let's take Pontiac, 382,000 vehicles sold, one engine, that's really easy math, that's 382,000 engines per, let's call it uh, 300, uh, sorry, one engine per 382,000 cars. But in 1979, if I look at 900,000 divided by seven, that's less than 150,000 units per engine. So I have half of the scale that I had back in 1959, in spite of selling more cars. And Chevrolet is basically the same. You can see here, this ratio, if I take 1.4 million and divide it by three, that ratio is about double the ratio of 2.2 million divided by nine engines. So far less in terms of the number of vehicles sold per engine just 20 years later. And of course, as if I were to fast forward this through the decade of the 80s, as General Motors share went from the mid 40s down into the 30s, and the market didn't really expand enough to offset that, this would be even more exacerbated. So what happens? If you allow me, I will make a little graph to describe this. In the industry, this would be called economies of scale or a scale curve. And what it does is it describes the cost per unit and what its relationship is to the number of units that are produced. 
So here we are. Here's, imagine this is the number of units produced, and this is the cost per unit. So if the line is going in this direction, that's higher cost per unit. And if the line were going in this direction, that's more units being produced. Well, what do you notice? That as the number of units produced goes, it increases, the cost per unit comes down. And it comes down at a relatively steep slope to begin with. And then it levels off. And so if you start getting into this region here, which I will color code green, you get into a point of the economies of scale where you have the fancy economics term, if you want to impress your friends, is diminishing marginal returns. And what does that mean? That basically means you get little additional benefit in terms of the cost per unit as you sell more units. And if you're in this region where the curve is very steeply sloping, I'll color that in red, you have diseconomies of scale and small changes in volume create large changes in cost per unit. So back when you had, as an example, I had for 1959, Pontiac sold almost 400,000 vehicles in one engine. You're at this point on the scale curve in this green zone. You've got a lot of units that you're making, and the cost per unit is relatively low. However, as the engine proliferation increased and the number of vehicle platforms increased, you really start going backward on this graph and going up into this red zone. So if you're an auto company, what do you do about that? You try to drive back down this way and you do that by taking out complexity and configurations, by taking out engines. This is why after 1976, there was a big powertrain consolidation at General Motors. So all the 455s went away, the Cadillac 500 went away in 1977. And then you start seeing the Buick 350 being used in not just Buicks, the Pontiac 301 being used, not just in Pontiacs, the Olds 403 being used, not just in Oldsmobiles. And the reason for that is General Motors was picking an engine that was made for, of a certain size by various divisions and then proliferating them across their portfolio to try to get back into this green area of the cost curve. This curve also explains issues in many different industries and why you might see costs being high in one industry and you wonder well, why is that versus another. So as an example, if I wanted to pick a very specialty item, uh, let's say it could be a specialty liquor, it could be a special manufacturer, it could be an aircraft seat that's used on aircraft. There are not many of those made. It could be a specialty car like a McLaren or a Ferrari or, you know, let's call it even a Corvette special model. I don't have many units over which I can spread the fixed costs associated with performing or making those items. And the fixed costs might be the overhead of various people, the utilities and the facilities where they're made, the real estate taxes, the labor that's not necessarily touching the part. I don't have many units to spread that over, and so I get into this red range of the curve. But in the green range, let's say I'm Apple and I'm selling iPhones. I sell 270 million a year. I'm in this green range, definitively, because I'm selling so many, I'm, I'm making so many that my cost per unit is relatively low. And that's how they're able to deliver technology on iPhones for relatively low price. They're in this area of the scale curve. So this is something that you can think about when you go to the store or you go to anywhere to buy things, Home Depot, Lowe's. You can sort of understand, well, why are things priced the way they are? Now, sometimes they're priced the way they are, not just because of the scale economy. Not everything is priced on a cost plus basis. It's a good starting point. But, you know, if I have a brand item, uh, 
I may not price in accordance with what my cost is because I have the brand that people will pay for. It's a whole nother topic of conversation. But I hope this at least sheds some light on, number one, how was General Motors able to afford that proliferation of engines and transmissions too? There were different transmissions back in 1959. Buick had the Dynaflow, there was the regular Hydromatic, there was the Power Glide. I mean, there were a number of different transmissions. And how they were able to afford that versus what happened 20 years later. And it really comes down to the scale curve. Hope you enjoyed that porch chat here on the frigid weekend. I'm going to go back inside and warm up. And until the next video, take care. Thanks for watching this porch chat. If you enjoyed it, please like and subscribe and as comment as well. That helps the YouTube algorithm serve this video up to more people like you. Also, feel free to email me at rareclassiccars at yahoo.com and check out a few videos with the thumbnails at the bottom left and bottom right that are proposed for you. Also, if you're not yet subscribed, click on the circular icon of the 67 Buick Riviera at the top left and then hit the bell to ensure you get notified of all my future videos. Thanks again for watching.